Today's edition of Tuesday Second Chance, our series of case studies on various maritime incidents. Today's case is going to be the case of the fishing vessel Captain Winston, which was interdicted in the Caribbean Sea near the Les Antilles Islands in January of 2004, on suspicion of the transport of illicit narcotics. Our objectives for today's edition of Tuesday Second Chance are first of all to examine the facts of the operation which was conducted to both intercept and board the fishing vessel Captain Winston, which as I said was a vessel suspecting of transporting narcotics. We're also going to examine the issues related to the cooperation between coastal states, the verification of the flag state of the suspect vessel and the use of force during counter narcotics operations. During this process we'll also discuss the implications of Article 92.2 of UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and the articles related to right of visit, Article 110. Finally, we'll discuss the responsibilities that intercepting forces have to respect the well-being of any persons detained during such an operation. Let's begin from the background of the suspect vessel. The fishing vessel Captain Winston was a pretty typical fishing vessel, a trawler with a reported flag of St Vincent and the Grenadines. It was an 18 meter vessel which is relatively typical for that region and there had already been suspicion surrounding this vessel and in fact the UK Customs Agency because the United Kingdom has a number of islands within the Caribbean had reported this vessel as being suspected of being involved in illicit activities. In fact their analysis indicated that the vessel was being used to pick up narcotics from larger motherships which were staying outside the territorial seas of the various island states. And then the fishing vessel Captain Winston was being used to bring these illicit cargoes ashore. She was reported to have departed from the port of Kingston in the island of St Vincent at midnight on the 18th of January 2004. Just to give you an idea, this is the operational area which we're speaking about, the Lesser Antilles. The Lesser Antilles are a chain of islands stretching along the easternmost border of the Caribbean Sea and stretching all the way down to Trinidad and Tobago which is just off the South American coast. This area has become a major transshipment area for narcotics which are produced um, and processed in many of the South American countries and pass through this island chain either heading northwards towards the United States or in some cases heading eastwards either directly to Europe or first to the African continent and then to Europe. More specifically the operational area which we are focusing on is between the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines which you can see down here heading all the way up past Guadeloupe and to Antigua and Barbuda, so this central section of the Lesser Antilles. As I've already said, a number of these islands are actually still part of the territory of European states, not just the United Kingdom, but also notably France. There are also Dutch possessions still within this area. However, also a number of these islands are now independent states. And you can see that the area as an operational area is very complex in that there are large numbers of islands, as I've described, under the jurisdiction of different countries, some independent countries, some being territorial possessions of European countries. So you can imagine that in order to conduct effective enforcement in this area, a very close cooperation between all the various states involved is extremely important. In addition, the United States also has a significant interest in this area because a large um, 
amount of the narcotics which are being smuggled northwards towards the United States from South America pass through this sea area. So the United States is also strongly involved in enforcement actions. In fact, once the vessel had been designated as suspect, it was tracked by a C-26 surveillance aircraft. Uh, this is operated by the regional security system. The regional security system is a security organization of the region, uh, incorporating assets and personnel from a number of countries. And in the case of their air assets, these are operated by the RSS Air Wing out of the island of Barbados. The RSS Air Wing has two of these C-26 aircraft which were donated by the United States in an effort to strengthen regional capabilities to interdict mostly narcotics trafficking. Uh, the crews on board are mixed crews coming from the various member states of the regional security system and once the Captain Winston was designated as a suspect vessel the RSS deployed one of these aircraft to track the vessel and it noted that after the vessel had exited the territorial seas of St. Vincent, it was noted to stop for a significant period of time before subsequently proceeding on a northerly course outside the territorial seas of the various islands. So here we have a graphical depiction of what the vessel was engaged in. As I've stated, it left the port of Kingston on St. Vincent then headed out of the territorial seas before stopping in this area for a significant period of time and then heading northwards outside the territorial seas. This way of acting was very typical of the suspicions that surrounded the vessel. Vessels do not stop at sea for extended periods of time unless there is a reason to do so. It could be fishing in the case of a fishing vessel however in this case it was known that the vessel was being used to transship um, illicit items from larger vessels which were passing by and the fact that the vessel first left territorial seas of St. Vincent and therefore left the jurisdiction of St. Vincent before stopping and conducting whatever activities it decided to conduct was indicative of the fact that an at-sea transfer of illicit goods could have occurred. Responding to both the information from the UK Customs and the observations from the patrol aircraft, the French authorities from one of the islands which form part of French territory, Guadeloupe, decided to deploy a patrol vessel. And the patrol vessel deployed was one of the 35 meter patrol craft they have in the area, the P722 Violette. She is a 30 knot patrol craft belonging to the Gendarmerie Maritime, which is actually a naval organization. So it belongs essentially to the French Navy. This vessel departed the port in Guadeloupe, Pointe à Pitre, at 20.38 hours in the evening. So clearly, having started at midnight, the suspect vessel had now proceeded a significant distance north, and the Violette was deployed to intercept this vessel as she proceeded northwards. The mission assigned to the Violette was relatively straightforward. First of all, to locate the suspect vessel, because for obvious reasons, the air surveillance could not be continued 24 hours a day. The master of the Violette was required to confirm the flag of the vessel in order to permit a request for boarding to be made to the flag state. You have to know who the vessel belongs to in order to make that request. And although there was some information that this vessel was registered in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, this had to be confirmed before such a request could be made. And obviously the master of the patrol vessel was told to be prepared to conduct a boarding of the vessel as required. The activities of the Violette continued to be supported by the maritime patrol aircraft from the regional security system. So although this aircraft could not remain on scene 24 seven, it continued to conduct surveillance flights in support of the interception of the suspect craft. The 
The actual interception took place to the west of the island of Guadeloupe, and it was uh, intercepted at 0528 hours in the morning of 19th January, in a position which was approximately 42 nautical miles west of Guadeloupe Island. So as you can imagine, this vessel was outside the territorial seas of Guadeloupe, which only extend to 12 nautical miles. However, it was still within the exclusive economic zone associated with that island, and therefore in a zone where the French authorities from Guadeloupe had jurisdiction over activities such as fishing, for instance. In fact, on intercepting the Captain Winston, the commanding officer of the patrol vessel asked the master of the vessel to confirm his, the name of his vessel and the flag. He was also informed that he was not clearly flying a flag because that flag has to be flown in a manner that it is visible. And this is in contravention of international law. And he was also informed that he was with the French, within the French exclusive economic zone associated with the island of Guadeloupe. This was important because the crew of the Violette had noticed that the Captain Winston had fishing gear in the water and therefore, for all intents and purposes, was actually engaged in fishing. And therefore, the commanding officer of the patrol vessel stated, look, you are fishing in an area under French jurisdiction, and therefore, I intend to conduct a fisheries inspection aboard your vessel. As you can see, the master of the Violette recognized that although the suspicion was to do with narcotics, he had a different jurisdiction which he could exercise more immediately and therefore chose to request that the Captain Winston stop for a fisheries inspection because she appeared to be engaged in fisheries within the French EEZ. The important point which comes out of this is although you may be intercepting a vessel on the basis of one suspicion, the jurisdiction you may have over that vessel could be of a different kind. And therefore, masters who are at sea with patrol vessels, persons making decisions ashore, need to think through all the possible jurisdictional bases they can use in order to be able to engage in a boarding operation. And in this case, the commanding officer of the Violette chose to use the basis of a fisheries inspection. And in fact, in this picture, you can clearly see what appears to be fishing gear, which is being streamed from the Captain uh, Winston. And on the basis of this fishing gear and the fact that the vessel was within the French EZ, this was used as the basis for a request to conduct a fisheries inspection aboard the Captain Winston. However, a person identifying himself as the master of the Captain Winston, replied on VHF radio and stated, first of all, that he was not engaged in fishing and therefore he rejected that request to board. He also identified his vessel as Captain Winston and stated that he was under the US flag. Now, the information received previously was that the vessel was registered in St. Vincent. Now you have the master declaring that his vessel is registered under the US flag. In return, the commanding officer of the patrol vessel informed the, the master of the uh, Captain Winston that the information they had was that the vessel was registered under the St. Vincent flag. Regardless of whichever flag, uh, the Captain Winston was registered under, he still appeared to be engaged in fishing in the French EEZ. And therefore, the commanding officer of the Violette stated clearly that he intended to exercise his right to board the vessel to conduct a fisheries inspection. The master of the Captain Winston immediately responded that he did not accept this jurisdiction. And in response, 
the commanding officer of the Violette instructed the master of the Captain Winston to heave to, to stop his vessel immediately, and also gave an initial verbal warning that failing to comply with these instructions could result in the use of force to ensure that he complies. The response of the Captain Wilson was actually very interesting. Basically, a few minutes later, personnel on board the Captain Winston hoisted a US flag. Now, this is a very interesting act insofar as he was declaring that he was registered under the US registry. But more importantly, he was claiming the protection of his state of registry, the United States. And in the Caribbean, when you are claiming protection of the United States, you are basically claiming protection from what is the largest and most influential state perhaps in that region. So this was a clear attempt to dissuade the commanding officer of the Violette and say, look, I'm registered with the United States. If you mess with me, you are messing with the United States. So this was a very, very clear attempt to put doubt into the mind of the commanding officer of the Violette and complicate the situation. However, at this point in time, it's worth looking at the two articles of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, that we mentioned earlier. The first is Article 92.2. And that states that when a vessel sails under two or more flags, according to convenience, it effectively becomes a stateless vessel. Now, there was clear information that the Captain Winston was actually registered in St. Vincent. However, here we have the personnel on board the vessel hoisting an American flag and the master claiming that he is on the US registry. A vessel cannot be on two registries at the same time. A vessel should not change its flag at sea. So it should only change its registration when the vessel is in port. If it attempts to use two flags, then effectively it loses both of them and becomes stateless. So at this point in time, due to his actions, the master of the Captain Winston had lost not only the protection of the flag of St. Vincent, but also the protection of the flag of the US and was effectively a stateless vessel. In addition, if there is any doubt about which flag a vessel should be carrying, Article 110 of UNCLOS permits the right of visit, which is a right given to state vessels to go on board a vessel and conduct a boarding to verify which flag they have the right to fly. So by conducting these various um, subterfuges or, or, or trying to hide his identity and his registration, effectively what the master of the Captain Winston did was actually open himself up to even more jurisdiction and more bases for boarding. Noting that the vessel was still refusing to stop, and having given the master of the Captain Winston a number of both verbal warnings on VHF and visual warnings using signal flags. At 12.40 that day, the commanding officer of the Violette received authorization to use warning shots in an attempt to stop the vessel. He began to position the Violette to fire these warning shots. Clearly, the people on board the Captain Winston noticed this. And in response, they began throwing packages overboard, at least five packages. At this point in time, there was a French Navy aircraft providing surveillance, and the Violette handed over the surveillance of the Captain Winston to this aircraft, which was a Falcon, and instead moved to recover the packages which had been thrown overboard from the Captain Winston. These packages, which consisted basically of sacks and suitcases, were found to contain packets of a substance which was suspected of being narcotics. 
Having gathered all the evidence, the Violet resumed pursuit at 1310 and noted, however, that the Captain Winston has now increased speed and was attempting to enter the territorial seas of St. Kitts and Nevis. St. Kitts and Nevis is another one of the island states in this region. Had this vessel managed to enter the territorial seas, it would have been complicated for the French vessel to continue pursuit into the territorial seas of another state. The commanding officer of the Violette now informed the master of the Captain Winston that he was suspected of drug trafficking and that he had permission from the flag state under Article 17 to be able to board his vessel on the basis of this suspicion. To give you an idea of how far this chase has proceeded, here you can see the original position of interception, and here you can see the position at which the drugs or suspected narcotics were dumped overboard, and this is the limits of the territorial seas of St. Kitts and Nevis. So clearly the vessel was attempting uh, to escape into the territorial seas of another state, and thereby make the commanding officer of the French patrol vessel stop his pursuit. Having again positioned his vessel, the commanding officer of the Violette then gave permission for warning shots to be fired. Ten warning shots were fired from a machine gun on the vessel. The response of the Captain Winston was not to stop. Instead, the master of the Captain Winston then began to maneuver in a very dangerous manner clearly intended to cause a collision with or to ram the Violette. And there were at least two attempts to uh, ram or come into contact with the patrol vessel. Having seen what was happening, the CEO of the Violette then requested permission from his authorities to engage the vessel with direct disabling fire and informed the master of the suspect vessel that this would happen if he did not stop his vessel immediately. Clearly, the master of the Captain Winston saw sense, and at 13.35 hours, so some um, eight hours after the initial interception, the Captain Winston stopped, and the master began to comply with the instructions of the intercepting vessel. In total, eight individuals were found on board. They were apprehended, and the vessel was searched. During this search, additional narcotics were detected. And the master was unable to provide any proof of the flag state of his vessel. He could not prove it was under the US flag, nor could he prove it was under the St. Vincent flag. Given that it was not completely clear where the vessel was registered or whether it was indeed registered at all, at this point in time, the decision was taken to act in a manner that would not impact on any flag state rights if it was then subsequently found that the vessel was registered in a particular country. So the vessel was still apprehended, but certain decisions were taken in order to ensure that flag state rights would not be impacted. Having stopped the vessel, conducted the search, the decision was then taken to escort the vessel to shore. And during this escort, a number of gendarmerie personnel remained on board the Captain Winston to secure the vessel. The crew were restrained, so they were put in restraints and were not permitted to move about the vessel. However, unfortunately, at five minutes past 11 that night, it was noted that one of the crew was missing. This individual had earlier asked to have his restraints removed in order to be able to use the bathroom and the restraints had his hands behind his back. After he had used the bathroom, he had requested that the restraints be moved in front of his body because due to particular medical condition, he was finding it very uncomfortable with his hands behind the back. What appears to have happened is that due to the weather conditions, which was extremely clear and very calm seas, the individual in question had seen lights ashore that gave him the impression that he was relatively close to shore and potentially took a chance in attempting to swim ashore. 
On noticing that a person was missing, both the Violette and the Captain Winston began a search operation in the area. Aviation assets were also dispatched to the area as well as additional ve vessels. However, unfortunately, the missing individual was not located. It should be noted that when the person went missing, they were still 20 nautical miles from shore, but as already mentioned, very clear weather condition and also lights ashore which were on mountains at 1,000 meters above sea level potentially gave this individual the impression that the coastline to which he could escape by swimming was much closer than it actually was. Clearly it was not a, um, a viable distance for the individual to swim to shore. 20 nautical miles in restraints was clearly impossible. So in summary, this particular incident saw very close cooperation between various states through both the regional security system and bilateral exchanges to detect and to intercept the vessel suspected of smuggling narcotics. You had state rights under Articles 92.2 and 110, which were exercised to conduct the boarding, as well as the use of Article 17 and flag state permission due to the trafficking of narcotics. The non-compliance of the suspect vessel eventually required a limited use of force, in this case warning shots, and after the apprehension of the vessel, unfortunately one suspect individual went missing. So after they had been apprehended and put in restraints, uh, this particular individual appears to have made an attempt to escape during which he went missing, believed deceased. So, as I always do at the end of these presentations, I would like to now throw some points out on the floor for us to think about. First of all, how good are the processes we have in our organizations to both authorize and use force? As you can see from this case, the commanding officer of the Violette was required to request permission from ashore to use eventually warning shots and potentially deadly force. This is a procedure which takes time and relies on good communications. Is it the best procedure? Is it the most um, ideal procedure? Are there advantages to this? Are there disadvantages to this? You also noted that there was a very high level of regional cooperation and communication. So you had the initial information coming from UK customs. You had the regional security system engaged in providing surveillance. You had French armed forces conducting the interception. What does this look like where we are? Do we have this regional cooperation? Can we communicate with other agencies? What about the rights of states to board vessels who are stateless or using multiple flags? What rights do we have? And do our personnel know about these rights? Are they familiar with how, when, and where they should be exercised? And the final point, which I'd like to think about, is when we've arrested an individual and we've apprehended an individual, what obligations do we have towards that individual? Is that now a criminal who we can treat as we wish? Or is that still an individual where we have to take into account their physical, mental well-being and ensure that the conditions in which they are being held are suitable and appropriate? So these are the four points which I'd like to potentially discuss today. So that concludes the presentation regarding the Captain Winston. Thank you for listening to me. I'm going to stop sharing the presentation for now and open the floor to any comments or questions that there may be from your side. Anybody who has any questions or comments about the subject which we've addressed today. Let's look at use of force because this is a, a very difficult issue. 
Regarding use of force, is this something which should be authorized by the highest levels of your organization? Or do you think that this is something which needs to be trusted to people who are actually at sea, on scene, and able to make a decision based on the facts that they are seeing? Any views there? My personal experience is where I have worked, the decision on use of force has been that of the commanding officer. So the commanding officer of the vessel may make the decision when, where, and how much force to use. And obviously, take responsibility for that decision. But I also know that whenever possible, we would inform our authorities prior to using force. As you can see in this particular case, the structure was the commanding officer had to request permission from his authorities ashore. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these? Any ideas? Any comments on this? Are you happy in trusting the use of force to a young lieutenant? Olivia, I can see you've got your mic on. Yeah, no, it's just to, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> to add uh, to add information about um, about the, the French system here in, in the French uh, law, uh, the prime minister uh, is responsible of the use of force in peacetime. So by law, we have to to refer to to the prime minister, and of course it is done through the uh, through the line of, uh, of command. And as a result, indeed, uh, the um, uh, the commanding officer of a ship has to require uh, permission. Uh, before it cannot, it is. I don't think. Okay, I, I left the institution now ten years ago, but I didn't hear about any use of force that was uh, that was um, uh, granted before uh, before the action, a long long time before the action. It is uh, most of time something I would say all of time uh, something that is is must be required just before action. Um, and, and this indeed uh, creates um, some difficulties uh, since uh, if the ship is not fitted uh, with a good communication system, uh, it can be a problem. And uh, I don't know if the, uh, but I guess sometimes it will, it will cause, it, ha it has caused some um, cancellation of operation because you must have either a good uh, HF and HF is never good. <laughs> Or, or a good satellite system, and, and this, uh, these uh, systems are not uh, fitted on, on our ships. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that very good point, Olivier. As you can see, the, one of the disadvantages of having higher authority grant the use of force is that it takes time, and it relies on um, communication systems which may or may not be available. Glenn, please. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. Um, just to make a point about, about that, when it came to uh, EU NAV4 in 2008, when uh, addressing the, uh, the piracy in Gulf, Gulf of Aden and the Western Indian Ocean, uh, getting that uh, rule, of, uh, rule of law and, and the, you know, uh, the, the point there, you had to try and work out what was required prior to the operation starting. So as it was an EU mission, uh, obviously it had to be, go back to uh, up the chain of command, but it had to make sure that um, you know, 20, 27 nations uh, agreed to those policies as well. So it was a lot of backwards and forwards before they reached uh, even a minimum level uh, that, they, that they all agreed on. Uh, and it wasn't something that was then agreed on and then left as it was. It had to be an iterative process to make sure that any situations that might change were then reflected in what would be a lawful, uh, a lawful response. Uh, so, you know, when, when an incident did occur, the, the commanding officer of the, uh, the task force, first of all, uh, before you even get down to the individual uh, units involved, they had to make sure they were following the, the the policies that were passed down to them from the from the OHQ, but also from the the EU as well. So it's, it's not something that you can just have as a a, a one-off and expect it to meet the situation because the situation can change very rapidly. So there's 
um, it, I don't say it ties the, the command officer's hands, but it does make sure that they remain within the rule of law for themselves, because it's important that they can they can um, use that in a judicial process to get to that legal finish. So it's one of those things that you have to make sure you you, you keep within the framework uh, as much as possible. And if that that framework doesn't meet, you have to, as Olivia stated, you need to make sure that you have um, uh, communications be able to respond as quickly as possible. Yeah, that's my Thanks, Glenn. Glenn brings up two very important uh, issues here. The first is that at the end of the day, to at least some extent, the use of force is a political issue. And uh, sometimes the decision to be able to use force has to go very high up the political chain. The other point which Glenn made, and which is also very important, is that at the end of the day, the most important thing is that any use of force will stand up to scrutiny in a court. Because if you are going to use force, you're likely to finish up subsequently in legal proceedings of some sort. And the last thing that you want to do is finish up in legal proceedings and you have found to have used force excessively or improperly. Uh, my perspective, as I said, is when I was at sea, I was fully authorized to use force without further permission. That sounds very good from a tactical perspective. The downside is that you are shouldering all of the legal responsibility for what you are about to do. So if you are going to give that responsibility to your people at sea, you also need to make sure that they are adequately trained, that they have adequate knowledge and procedures to be able to do that in a proper manner without causing significant harm to large numbers of people. Any other comments or remarks regarding use of force? I'm seeing Mr. Rossi. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Inspector Rossi from the Mauritius Coast Guard. Pleased to meet you, sir. Good morning. Uh, uh, same to you. Uh, just one thing. Uh, we we're talking about the use of force. I know that sometimes when we are at sea, communication is an issue. So it all depends on the situation. The commanding officer, he is in charge of the vessel, and he has to take the right decision at the right time. Now, in our law, the National Coast Guard Act of 1988 gives uh, sufficient powers to the commanding officer uh, to fire upon uh, a vessel if upon being hailed by the Coast Guard vessel does not stop immediately, lie to or maneuver in such a way to permit the members of the NCG to board the vessel. So firstly, there's a warning shot. Now, if he doesn't comply with the warning shot, then the commanding officer has authority to fire into the vessel, not to harm someone, but uh, just to uh, disable the vessel, something like that. My question is, can it be exercised in the high seas or is it limited to the Mauritian waters? Uh, I think if we have also the proper rules of engagement for each unit, things will go a bit uh, smoothly. However, the captain remains the master in decision taken because uh, in case of retaliation by the opponent, uh, we still have to defend ourselves, like uh, using such amount of force that is needed as self-defense so that to protect the vessel and the uh, personnel. So 
being given that in our law uh, this is mentioned clearly uh, I think personally that we can exercise some jurisdiction but to what extent I leave the floor to you if someone can help. Thank you. Thank you, Inspector Rusty. That's a very, very good question. Um, first of all, I would like to emphasize a point made. The right of self-defense, the right to defend yourself against aggression, is always available to the master or the commanding officer of a patrol vessel. So if somebody is acting in a manner that is attempting to damage your vessel or injure your crew, then clearly there is an immediate right to use force to the extent required to protect your vessel. Regarding the use of force on the high seas, it comes down to a question of jurisdiction. Glenn earlier mentioned the issue of counter piracy. Counter piracy operations, by definition, occur on the high seas because piracy is a high seas crime. So as long as you have jurisdiction over the crime, your national procedures on use of force may be applied. That's not to say that they won't be challenged. There have been a number of court cases in the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea related to what one state has perceived to be the excessive use of force by another state. And they make very interesting reading. So uh, use of force is not an open-ended check. It's important to keep that in mind. I'm seeing Mr. Galbar has his microphone on. Mr. Galbar, do you have a question? Okay, good morning. No, I don't have any question, just I have a Okay, thank you, Mr. Galbar. So coming back to what Inspector Rossi mentioned, it's very important that you have jurisdiction over the crime before you even think about using force as a tool to ensure compliance. There is always a procedure of providing warnings, both verbal warnings, visual warnings, warning shots, and the use of force must be limited to what is required to ensure compliance. Let's go a step further, if we may, and, and go to the last point that I had mentioned. Um, once you've actually apprehended individuals, what are your views regarding, toward, regarding your obligations towards them? Are you now responsible for these individuals? Do they belong to you? Do you have to make sure that they are safe, well looked after, provided with medical treatment, unable to hurt themselves or harm themselves? Is this something that you feel is now an obligation or are they just suspects who need to be brought to a court? I think, Olivier, you have a, a point to make? Yeah, sorry, it was on the previous point. Um, okay. Um, I see two, two kind of issues in, uh, in using, uh, uh, in exercising a force out of uh, tidal water, let us say. There, there are two things here. There is the, according to me, there is the, the jurisdiction of the states. And as you say, if you have jurisdiction over the crime, then uh, it's, uh, it's a necessary point. But uh, there is also uh, the permission for the agent of the state to use this force. And sometimes it is not automatic. Uh, ju jurisdiction can be established, but since uh, an individual agent may not have what is, whatever it is, a, a commanding officer of a ship, this commanding officer of the ship may not have, uh, I would say, administrative uh, permission to use, uh, to use force. That's all. Very good point. Um... For instance, police forces generally have their activities limited to the territory of the state to which they belong. And therefore, even though international law would potentially permit them to use force on the high seas, their national law may restrict them from doing so because they are limited to territory. So it is not just a question of uh, whether international law accepts that that is uh, appropriate, but also that your domestic law provides you with the right to exercise those activities in that particular place. I can see that we have a question from Utam Gunes, RCOC. 
Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. I apologize for my pronunciation of names. I'm not very good at that. Uh, until uh, it is Utam, uh, as long as it is not our mind, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Utam uh, from OCOC, and uh, I'm also the ILO Mauritius based OCOC. I would like to uh, thank uh, Inspector Rusi for the very uh, interesting questions which he generally faced out at sea. But I think uh, the panel has taken it very uh, clearly. I think we are talking basically about uh, jurisdictions. You have what we call the flag state jurisdictions and when it can exercise that jurisdictions uh, within the territory of, of, of its uh, state. And if it is a, a, a Mauritian flagship also, they have got uh, that type of uh, jurisdictions. But uh, depending on the crime, as you rightly said, uh, uh, if I take the example of, of narcotics, uh, you will have a lot of difficulty to exercise such type of, of jurisdiction because it is not a universal jurisdiction. So I think it is it is what uh, basically the National Coast Guard or Mauritius is facing and it is a challenge because when you have to decide finally, uh, I've been captain of a ship, uh, to, to fire at the ship you think uh, 100 times before you, 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 you decide to either fire or not fire. You, you always like to use all means appropriate to stop the ship and depending on the type of threat that it is. But uh, I think the National Coast Guard Act also mentioned uh, uh, based on, on what uh, Inspector Rusi said, uh, if you look to uh, uh, section 10, subsection 5, it says that no action civil or criminal shall lie in respect of anything done in good faith in compliance with the section that the inspector was saying. So if anything is being done in good faith within the jurisdictions, uh, uh, I think I think it's okay. But the question of, of, of Rusi was mainly with uh, where, how far can you exercise it? So I think it is very clear. It is flag state jurisdiction. So it is limited to the, what, what, what the reason uh, the flag state. Was. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Otam. I, I would like, however, to point out something which is very important. You indicated that there is a limitation clause. So there is a clause that limits liability. That clause is in your national law and therefore limits your liability within your national law. It does not limit your liability, for instance, in front of an international court. So a, an action brought against your state in the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea or the International Court of Justice will not be subjected to that limitation of liability. It can still find complete liability for the actions. So these issues of limiting liability based on good faith, uh, I agree that they are important because they stop frivolous uh, cases of people trying to sue you for having done your job. That I fully agree with. However, they are not a 100% um, a protection against liability. It still opens your state potentially um, to the issue of liability of the state in an international tribunal. So it's important to keep that in mind. Okay, just one point I would also like to make um, because Glenn has just pointed it out. Glenn, when he was speaking, spoke about ROE. ROE are basically rules of engagement. They are those rules which are put in place to govern how and when force may be used, in what manner, and against uh, what particular individuals. So it's important to keep that acronym in mind. So let's go back to the, the question we had begun to uh, address of our obligations towards apprehended persons. Uh, so we've gone out to sea, we've conducted this operation, we have found somebody smuggling drugs, we have found somebody engaged in piracy, we've conducted a successful boarding, we found a number of suspects. What are our obligations towards those suspects? Because I can tell you that at the beginning of the piracy issue, uh, European navies in 2008 and 2009 had a big problem with this. Uh, they didn't know how to handle apprehended people. They were scared of uh, violating their individual rights. They were scared of them claiming a degree of protection or not from the state which had arrested them. And in many cases, although these persons had been found with 
all the items which any suspected pirate would have, such as weapons and boarding ladders. All that happened was these things were confiscated and the persons were put ashore without any further legal action. That's one extreme. On the other extreme, you cannot take an apprehended individual, an arrested individual, and chain them to a wall and give them no food and water for 20 days because you have to treat them in a manner which is commensurate with a human being. But what are legally the obligations towards these apprehended individuals? Are we now responsible for their, uh, these people? Or are these people now criminal suspects and therefore we can treat them in a manner which is different from how we would treat other people? Any comments or views on that from anybody? I mean, I'll speak from my, again, personal experience. Uh, once you've decided to arrest or apprehend a person, you are now faced with a completely new set of problems of keeping them in a place which is safe. Uh, you have to remove items with which they could potentially harm themselves. Uh, you have to ensure that you are providing them with the appropriate food, water, and sanitary facilities. Uh, because when you come into court, I can guarantee that the first thing their defense lawyers will say is that you treated them like an animal and you gave them no food and you gave them no water and you hit them. And they do this in order to gain the sympathy of the court. So even from a purely uh, perspective of wanting to win the court case, it is important that you treat the individuals in a manner which is appropriate. But how far does this responsibility go? And it varies again from state to state. Are you 100% responsibility for their well-being? If something happens to them, could you be held liable for what has happened to them? Could the family sue you and say, because you did not look after my father, husband, uncle, son, whatever? Or is it a case of you have to do the best you can to look after them, but then if they decide to do something reckless or stupid, your liability and responsibility ends? Any comments on this? I'm seeing uh, Mr. Issa al Rawahi with his camera on. Do you like to speak, sir, or are you just trying out your camera? Just trying out the camera. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Inspector Russi, I can see you have your microphone on. Yes. Uh, concerning the uh, care and custody of someone that is arrested during the course of duty, uh, the, the, law, the laws here in Mauritius are very uh, adamant on that. We need to take care of the arrested person from the time he's arrested until uh, he is brought before a magistrate. So custody, when the guy is in your custody, which means food, appropriate place for uh, a living, eventually you, you won't keep him in a five-star hotel, but what is required basically for a human being like uh, uh, warm clothes, uh, a place to sleep, uh, ventilation, food, etc., is to be given to that uh, individual because this might be challenged in case. And we have seen in a lot of cases where the rights of individuals have been challenged in court and has led to the uh, a, has been damning to the case, which has led to a no prosecution. So here, the laws are very strict about that. And Mauritius is signatory to the uh, Human Rights Convention. So we are being watched. There are mechanisms in uh, place to look that uh, these rights are uh, clearly uh, respected. This guy, these uh, laws are criminal. You can be sued criminally, and you can be sued also civilly for that. So here, 
let me tell you, <laughs> we, we are very concerned about that. Thank you. Could I, could I just ask you a question, sir? In this particular case, which happened under, under French jurisdiction, the individuals were put in restraints. That's because French law permits that to happen. Uh, where I come from, from Malta, uh, at sea, we were not allowed to put a person in restraints for safety reasons, unless there was extreme danger to our personnel. What does it look like uh, in your case, sir? Would you be allowed to put restraints on an individual who is being held at sea? Uh, we don't put restraint at sea, but if the situation warrants that we need to protect the individual and uh, the law enforcement officers, yes. But what I've learned from previous courses, uh, in different countries, it is different, as you rightly said. Uh, I've asked uh, one of my instructors when I did the boarding officers course with the uh, US Coast Guard. Uh, they say, okay, you put a life jacket on him and put the restraint. If he fell, if he fall in water, so he will be able to breathe unless the head hits a hard surface or uh, uh, something else unfortunate happens to him. But once uh, you, uh, you want to control uh, the individual, you want to restrain his movement, put a life jacket on him and put the cuff. So here we do have uh, very specific uh, procedures we don't put restraint, but if the individual is violent or there's a tendency to behave in an awkward manner, yes, we do put restraint. Thank you for that feedback, sir. And I think what that illustrates is that every country and every administration approaches these issues in a different manner. And when you are operating regionally and therefore in cooperation with other states, it's very important that you are familiar with how your partners work because you do not want to work in a manner which is contrary to uh, what they are applying. I'm seeing Utam, is, you have your hand up, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I think it's, these are very interesting questions which the inspector is raising. And uh, I would like to bring maybe some practical uh, challenges that uh, people who work at sea face. You know, when, when, uh, when we are talking about a platform that is not stable, sometimes you may take someone on your own ship and your own ship is, uh, you have to manage your ship because of the weather sometimes. You have your crew who is uh, trying to keep uh, things moving and you have another burden to keep someone on your ship. Now this gentleman that you have taken, maybe he, he might be able to sustain bad sea condition or not. So how do you uh, uh, ensure his safety on your own ship where you have to ensure the safety of the ship and the safety of the crew? So that was a uh, big challenges that sometimes uh, 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 people face at sea. And generally when you go in a court of law, everything is stable there and uh, the magistrate uh, sometimes would look at facts and evidence. But what uh, people uh, face at sea is a different story altogether. If I can have your, your, your expert comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Otam. Yes, clearly the environment in which these operations occur is very difficult and I, I'm sure uh, Olivier will also have more to say about this particular subject. Uh, and there are limitations when you are on a frigate, you have limitations which are not too bad, but when you are working on smaller vessels, patrol boats, etc., you have limitations of space. You have limitations of facilities. You have um, limitations regarding the stability of the vessel and how safe you can keep the vessel. Uh, it's a dangerous place even for the people who work there. So it is an extremely dangerous place for anybody who is apprehended there. Um, so yes, I agree. Uh, it is important that at some point 
during legal proceedings, you, you make an attempt to explain the reality to the courts and some courts understand it better than others. Um, but being able to, to explain the environment to legal practitioners can be extremely difficult. Olivier, uh, you would like to add something? Yes, just um, <clears throat> um, to highlight the importance of uh, the report, of course, because in your report, you will explain why you restrain the people, uh, how long and all these kind of things. And also the, the power of pictures. Uh, we are, we in the French uh, gendarmerie uh, are encouraged to, uh, to take pictures of everything, to document uh, what we do. Uh, and uh, this is a very powerful means to explain the situation to a court, because sometimes uh, in the courts, uh, the, um, uh, the knowledge of the sea uh, from the court is very poor. So this is why uh, illustrating, explaining uh, why you uh, took this specific decision uh, using, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, sentences, but also pictures is very important. Yes, thank you for that, Olivier. That's that's a very, very relevant point. Um, at the end of the day, uh, your operation is only as good as the report you write about it. So that is what it will be judged on by the people who were not there. So uh, nobody enjoys writing reports, uh, but they are the tool which we can use both, as uh, Olivier pointed out, both by means of words, images, videos, etc. They are the tool we can use to communicate the reality of a situation, what happened, why it happened, um, to uh, a court which is trying to understand the situation remotely. So yeah, that's also a very important point. Any other comments or questions regarding um, our obligations towards people who we've apprehended or arrested? No. Uh, the last comment I would like to make is um, regarding the regional cooperation and communications in this case. And I mention it because I think that what is being done in the Caribbean, especially between the small island states who have all very limited resources, is a very, very interesting template, a very interesting example to look at. Uh, the regional security system is now a relatively old uh, arrangement. It's been around for more than 20 years. And it is very valuable in allowing all these small island states to cooperate to combat the threats which they are seeing develop in their region. Uh, and it's the basis for very strong cooperation between the states. As you have seen, it serves as the basis for the provision of operational resources, so they have this pooled resources like the uh, maritime patrol aircraft we were mentioning. It also has other um, arrangements, for instance, between the members of the regional security system, they can continue pursuing suspects into the territorial seas of the other members, which is quite an important right. You are saying, I will allow you to enter my territory to continue your law enforcement activities. So they have really built a very close and important cooperation between them. And they've done it because they recognize that as small states, they are very much threatened by security issues. They have limited resources and that they can make themselves much, much more effective by this close cooperation between them. Clearly, the RSS has the advantage that the states are all relatively close to one another. In the part of the world where most of you come from, so the Western Indian Ocean, there we are talking about immense distances. So there is the tyranny of distance and there are the issues related 
to supporting each other across these massive distances, which makes life a lot more difficult. And that's fully understandable. But looking at what these states have achieved within this framework, I think has important lessons for any uh, regional organization or any regional set of states, because they have really taken this particular cooperation to a level where, as regards maritime security, it is extremely developed and extremely useful. Are there any other comments or questions which any of the participants would like to make? I obviously yeah, have... Uh, oh, go ahead, sir, please. Yes. Thank you, appreciation. Uh, this is Yonis from Somalia, especially Mogadishu, the capital city. Uh, Good morning, sir. I just sir. want to drop one question. If, oh, oh. Good morning to you. Is that okay? Yes, it's okay. Go yes, ahead with the question. Yeah, uh, re with regards to the pirates, uh, here in Somalia, sometimes the uh, 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 Nabar forces within the area mistakenly get uh, some people innocent, like uh, fishermen, uh, mm -hmm. being blamed on a, a pirate activities. And they may sometimes be uh, deported from the area they were taking and get into the custody somewhere in India or et cetera, et cetera. So what will happen according to the pirates? Low, what will happen to the innocent people like those people? And what do you uh, think that the future might be uh, on them? Because some of them are still in the jails. So they are there and they are innocent. So how can we clarify? That's the question I want to ask you. Thank you. So thank you very much for that question. Um, addressing the issue of piracy. So first of all, uh, when a state takes it upon itself to arrest people who they suspect are pirates, they also have the obligation to give these individuals a proper legal proceeding. So they cannot say, we have decided you are pirates, you are going to jail for the rest of your life. They are obliged to take those individuals, bring them before a competent court, and ensure that they have adequate legal assistance to be able to defend themselves from those accusations. Does this mean that innocent people are never convicted by courts? No, of course not. Courts all over the world have at times and for various reasons uh, reached mistaken conclusions about individuals. Now, in this specific case, if those individuals are citizens of a particular state, then that state must use all the instruments it has at its disposal, be they diplomatic instruments, be they the use of international legal um, recourse, such as international courts, to attempt to defend their citizens from these accusations. There is no simple solution uh to this particular problem clearly courts in different countries could view a case in different ways so in front of one particular court it may be clear that these individuals are guilty whereas in front of another court it may be clear that these individuals are innocent so yes there is this problem but this is more a diplomatic issue where a diplomatic engagement with those states who have tried those particular individuals would probably be the most appropriate approach. Any other questions or remarks from the floor? So I'm not sure how well the interpretation has worked uh, in this particular. Oh, yes, I do have another question from, let me see, Mr. Aulad. Is that the correct pronunciation, sir? Aulad Mutrafi? No. Okay, it's not a question. It was just a thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, so I'm not sure how well the interpretation has worked across this um, particular presentation. I hope it has functioned reasonably well. We'll now be uh, discussing between the organizers to make sure that we will implement any improvements necessary for the next edition. I'd like to thank everybody who has been here today for participating in this webinar thank you very much for your interesting questions and discussion 
uh, it's important for us to hear what you have to say about these issues because uh, we would like to learn about what's happening in your states and what your challenges are. Um, so I'd like to thank you again for being here and I have one last request. As you know, uh, we attempt to provide publicity for these events and to do that clearly we need a good picture of uh, the particular webinar. So if those people who have no objection would be able to turn on their cameras at this time, it will allow uh, Isabel, our public affairs expert, to capture an image, which will then be distributed in our publicity materials. Again, there is no obligation to switch on your cameras, but if you could do so, we would greatly appreciate it, those who can. Uh, and then we will be able to take a quick picture for our publicity materials. Thank you very much. Isabel, over to you. Yes, wait. Uh, oh, sorry. Waiting a little bit uh, that I can have more face. Uh, yes, and, and sorry for, for those who try to listen in French, but we had, um, so it is, it started to be good at the beginning and then, uh, so I don't know, something wrong happened. But, so. We will continue to troubleshoot that issue and hopefully at some point we'll be able yes. to provide smooth French interpretation. Because if I had to speak in French, um, <laughs> that would be terrible for all those who would have to listen to me. I can assure so you. So if uh, no any other person wants to be there, Alex is here, we have everyone. I have everyone and uh, names and <laughs> hi, Andrew. Hi, nice Andrew. face. <laughs> so, um, so, yes. So if you can smile, so because you, you have listened to a very interesting uh, lecture and uh, so still exciting to, to, to listen to Andrew. So just now, okay, and another one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel, and thank you to everyone for your participation again and your patience with us. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties we appear to have had with uh, the interpretation. I do assure you that the next time we will make sure we improve on that. As things currently stand, we're looking forward to a potential next edition of Tuesday's Second Chance in either the first or second week of December. So we will be sending out our usual calling notice and uh, we'll be happy to see you uh, join us again. Uh, we're not quite sure which case study we're going to be using. We have two or three options, but uh, well prior to the event, we'll be sending out the calling notice and we hope to have you join us again for another interesting edition of Tuesday Second Chance. So if there are no further comments or remarks, thank you again for participating and look forward to seeing you again. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you on September.